What bothers me so often is the view of science that once you've explained something, you've explained it away. I, I don't quite understand what you mean by explaining away. I mean, there are explanations, which are accounts, testable, verifiable um, accounts of how things happen. Mm. I mean, what, what, what more is it? That is an explanation. Mm. Isn't that enough? Uh, not Isn't remotely. Enough? I mean, it's worth asking of anything that we know how that happened. Let us suppose uh, that Beethoven wrote symphonies because he needed to pay his bills, especially for his nephew, who was always getting into trouble. At the end of the day, we know exactly why Beethoven wrote music, and we can, through his biography, tell you how he wrote music. But we, when all the facts are in, there's a beauty to that music that is, is, is not explainable away. However, elaborate the scientific explanations are for that music centre in the brain. Well, I think we should all wait and see what science is capable of delivering. I mean, there are many things now that you would accept that science has given a beautifully rich, and I use the word beauty advisably, I think science is a beautiful yeah. process, um, for which there could have been no concept of an explanation in conventional terms in the past. I mean, let's take inheritance or life. I mean, most biologists these days would say that well, you know, we, we, we sort of know what life is. We know what the particular amazing complexities of molecules working together is that makes a collection of those molecules have what we call life. And you don't need anything else. I mean, there is no life force that you need to explain these things. Do you seriously believe, Colin, mm. that this entire Professor Colin Blakemore, who takes moral stands on the integrity of science and medical research is actually a self-flattering uh, myth that you are weaving around yourself because actually all those little grey cells in your brain have worked this out long before and you never had a choice. You couldn't have been other than a professor of science. Yeah, I do believe it. I mean, I believe that I am the sum total of all of the causal influences on me at the moment. And that is not a trivial issue. So you and really, really believe that you're deceiving yourself? the really interesting yourself, question is, well, if it were true, if it were true, then we'd have to abandon everything that we believe about the causal universe, about one event causing another, by all events having antecedent causes, and say that human beings are set aside from the rest of the physical world, and yet we know we're made up of the bits and stuff that the rest of the world is made up of. All the molecules in you were once upon a time in a star somewhere, and they've ended up by, in you by chance. So why not believe that we could also give an account of how those molecules working inside them produce their actions and produce this curious impression that we have of the sense of self and choice, as if there's a kind of helmsman inside there, really deciding absolutely what they're going to do, irrespective of what the world tells them. And what you've been saying is beautiful, magnificent, and it's pure reductivism. Yes. It is the well, idea that at the end of... When all said and done, a, muse, uh, a, a, a symphony is just a, a sequence, a reproducible sequence of sound waves registered on our oral equipment, that a painting is just a, a display of pigments on canvas, and that human beings adjust uh, electrical impulses in the brain. Well, it, it, I, I agree with all of that, except the word just. I mean, you diminish it by suggesting that to believe that we are causal machines, where we are simply caused by events of the past, is trivial. It's unbelievably complex and very surprising and really quite remarkable. We do have free will, and you cannot seriously, consistently believe that you don't. Even though your argument that there's a little fellow in there telling you all the time, this is really you, Colin, this is the real you, but mm -hmm. actually you and I and our selfish genes here are actually controlling and pulling all the levers. So really the question I suppose that I ask you is, what space left do you have for human dignity? This is really very important because what you imply 
is that without religious belief, people can't be good. They can't have a moral code, they can't have a compass, they can't have respect for other people. I think that's quite wrong. There's a great tradition of humanism uh, with a very strong moral underpinning, perfectly capable of assembling and operating laws and conventions of action, good behavior, without being guided by, by religious tracts and by religious dogma. On, on this, I'm going to agree with you. I think it's outrageous. Actually, you've agreed on an awful lot, and which I mean, we, yes, look, we must I, talk about. I, this I, I, listen, I bless you and I bless science for giving us the kind of complex insight into the nature of life, the nature of the human brain, and I find this wondrous, and I think you find it wondrous, and we both react with something like awe, hmm. which I give a religious name to and you don't. I agree with the chief rabbi. The biggest challenge to science, I mean, he would say it's off limits. I would say it's very much within our limits, is to explain human beings as thinking, reasoning, loving, fearing creatures. All of those things, I think, are within the territory of scientific explanation. And I would say if we could do that, then what would be left for religion to have faith in? Why would we need faith in anything anymore? We'll have to agree to disagree about whether science can really explain things like meaning, morality and beauty. What I can't accept is that human beings don't have free will. That's a denial of what makes us human. But of all the attacks from atheists and agnostics, there's one that no believer can hide from. My next guest is the historian and chair of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, Professor Lisa Jardine. She's the eldest child of the late academic, Jacob Bronowski, presenter of the television series The Ascent of Man, a Polish Jew who lost many relatives in the Second World War. Lisa poses the hardest question of all, why God allows suffering. I think that World War II was more of a watershed for Judaism than perhaps Judaism is prepared to admit. What I learned from my father is he combined two fundamental beliefs. Optimism for the human race, which is there in that Ascent of Man title, and remorse for what, on both sides, had been perpetrated in World War II. He was sent into Hiroshima and Nagasaki three months after the bombs were dropped as part of a fact-finding mission. Now, as chief rabbi, how did the faithful community respond to not just what was perpetrated on the Jewish people, but but also what was perpetrated on 80,000 Japanese in three seconds. We recognize that the Holocaust, perhaps together with what was done to bring the war to an end, those are critical moments. And I know Jews who lost their faith in the Holocaust, those who lost their faith because of the Holocaust. But with me, I lost another kind of faith when I began in my late teens to reflect on the Holocaust. I lost faith in humanity. I lost faith in the ability of a purely secular civilization to contain the destructive energies that we know are there in our midst. For me, the thing I can never get over is that the Holocaust took place at the very heart of liberal, post-enlightenment, scientifically-oriented Europe. I never lost faith in God because I never saw God as a strategic intervener who stopped us from exercising our freedom. I believe devoutly that in extremists, human beings behave with integrity, with compassion towards 
themselves and complete strangers. Human beings do behave very beautifully. And I see traces of God, of the divine presence, in all sorts of human beings, simple human acts of kindness. But I can't be an optimist, knowing what I do about history. But I know that ordinary human beings, when they assemble in crowds, can do terrible things. But where is God in the crowd? You know, there's a wonderful scene in To Kill a Mockingbird when the crowd assembles to lynch the black man mm. and the child steps forward mm. and addresses a civil word to a man in the crowd and the crowd is overcome with shame faced with a child whose values are intact and real. Mm. That I can understand. But where, in those terrible crowds, in those perpetrators of terrible deeds, tell me where God is for you. God, for me, is the protest against the crowd. I think, for me, religious faith is that courage to stand out against the crowd because God isn't in the crowd. He's in that prophetic voice that is willing to challenge the crowd. That raises the question of how God tolerates so much suffering in the world. <clears throat> it's the question of questions. If God exists, how does evil exist? And to me, this really separates out the religions or even different strands within a religion. There are religions of acceptance. It's God's will. We have to live with it. There are religions of comfort. It'll all be okay in another life. And there are religions of protest. And Judaism really is a religion of protest. And somehow or other, Evil pains God as much as it pains us. And he calls out to us, help me eliminate evil from the human heart because that's the one thing you have to do. I can't do it for you. And Jewish faith has been that sustained craziness of 4,000 years saying, no, we are not going to accept and no, we are not going to be consoled. We are going to fight for a world in which there is less evil and less suffering. Now that's an unusual religion. So you've explained that I grew up in the religion of struggle. I, yeah. I rather like that. <laughs> Keep struggling. Thank you, Chief Rabbi. Thank you. Well, of course, what was perhaps perturbing for me was how extraordinarily close the belief systems, the value systems of the chief rabbi and myself are. So after a lifetime of being a secular Jew, that's an admission I have to make. Well, this has been a challenging program to make, putting my faith on the line against some of today's finest atheist minds. I've become more aware of some of the problems skeptics have with faith, but we've also found important areas of common ground. For me, what these interviews have confirmed is that when it comes to faith, you have to take a risk, the risk of commitment. Religion isn't easy, nothing worthwhile is. In Judaism, faith means wrestling with God as Jacob once wrestled with an angel, and through it we emerge stronger, humbler, and I hope kinder. That's what Rosh Hashanah is about. At this dawn of a new Jewish year, I pray, may we be true to our faith and a blessing to others, regardless of their faith, as we live in God. May God live in us. Oh, <laughs> yeah.